Lascitor Ridiculus Mus. Have a good Christmas, Perry. <laughs> the atmosphere in the group was uh, very low at that point because we'd felt here was something that we'd, we'd really achieved. At long last, we'd done something that we had done. Uh, we'd been recording information for a long, long time, for years, in fact, and we finally hit upon something that either no one else knew about or at least they hadn't told the world about. Uh, we'd found it, we were ready to tell the world about it, and then the world did seem to want to know. In Washington, D.C., unbeknown to the Kettering Group, things were beginning to move. A government scientist, Charles Sheldon, had read the article in Flight magazine. He knew its importance, but his problem was how to alert the press, given government secrecy about the space program. Charles Sheldon, for perhaps two decades, was the most authoritative source of information on the Soviet space program in the open regime, the unclassified domain. And he worked for the Library of Congress, technically speaking, although he did go on assignment to the White House, and he also worked for one of the House committees, the Committee on Science and Astronautics. So he had a very broad experience in the U.S. government dealing with space activities, but his particular interest was Soviet space. Charles Sheldon, of course, had an enormous interest in space, and, and he's sitting up at the Library of Congress, and then he finds out that there is a place called Plazetsk, and he began talking about it. Why can't I print it? If the Russians have got a new launch site, presumably they know about it. So who are we keeping this from? I haven't said they've got a new site. You mean there's nothing to the story? Well, I haven't said they haven't got one either. Oh, God. I know, it's a damn silly game. I don't like playing it any more than you do, but I'm just a scientific advisor. I don't make the rules. I heard a theory. That this new site could only have been discovered with the aid of some super advanced uh, technology that we don't want the Russians to know we've got. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you don't know how funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I figured that would have to be bullshit. Do you read a magazine called Flight International? I've seen copies of it. Why? Well, some interesting items in it occasionally. You didn't happen to catch a small piece about two English schoolmasters, did you? Schoolmasters? What issue would that be in? November 10th. Hey, wait a minute. Well, I read the story in Flight Magazine, and, and it, it struck me as a, a much bigger story than I'm afraid that they played it. It was a time of extreme secrecy, it was a time when the space program was building up and nobody was talking about it. So I thought the best thing I'd do would be go to the scene. And uh, I went up to Kettering. And that's it? Basically, that's it. You say it's an American model? Ex-USAF. They're still in demand, too. Mm. Well, they're practically indestructible. And the receiver I got for 25 pounds. Well, how much is that in American money? $65. Wait till NASA reads this. <laughs> oh, listen, I've got a note that you predicted Discoverer's descent in 1963, and you got it closer than NASA did. Well, the actual burn-up was within minutes of what we'd predicted. Oh, wow. You know, sometimes I think that NASA's inclined to be a bit too cagey. You're telling me? Once they forecast a re-entry time, plus or minus 12 hours. <laughs> that, that's rubbish. They must have known better than that. Beauty part is, when the Post prints this, a lot of this information is going to have to be declassified. I mean, they can't file this as top secret. Not with you guys picking it out of the air with a Fred Flintstone kit. It means anybody can get these figures. Well, anybody can get the figures, but uh, take somebody like Jeff to know what they mean. Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, listen, you guys, I'm really obliged. Thanks a lot. Then the story ran, and suddenly there's a flurry. That's the only way you can ever figure out what a secret is. Suddenly there's a flurry of activity and you get calls. What is this Plazetsk? What is Kettering? And then there, there got to be what we'd call in Washington a certain movement on the thing. I have a feeling that whatever we had up at that time in the way of surveillance satellites 
and remember this was the 60s and they weren't anything near as fancy as they are now, KH-12s, that I think that they were all moved to Plazetsk in one heck of a big hurry. And the fact that Jeffrey Perry and Mr. Slater and a few lads up there could cause this kind of a flurry in the American intelligence community, I find utterly amusing and still astonishing. We were disappointed by the lack of reaction from the technical press and elsewhere. But here was a newspaper, an American newspaper. The balloon really had gone up. Gee. Well, I'll tell him you're here. Daily Express, you said, but actually he's... Oh, excuse me. Um, the thing is, the BBC television people are coming at 10.30 and another lot from London. Excuse me. Excuse me. Could you ring back in ten minutes and he'll talk to you himself? Mike? What? You've got to be ready by 10.30. Wear your school uniform. Get hold of some of the others. All right. Excuse me. Gee, you... Gee? Yes? You must come and talk to them. And gee... What? Don't say yes to any television before 10 o'clock. You must get your hair cut. Message received and understood. Hey, life, look at me. I can see the real The day we after we broke up for the Christmas holiday, the whole of the world's media descended upon Kettering. We had over 60 phone calls. Five TV crews, they got me out of the barber's chair, out of the bar, they stopped me playing golf. We were quite unprepared for the fuss and uh, publicity that we gained from this. We had film crews and cameramen and reporters uh, flocking into the, uh, into the labs. I've never experienced anything like it, and to be what was basically a national hero, if you like, to be on national television, uh, in, in a little sleepy town like Kettering at the time, I was walking around the streets thinking everybody in Kettering must have seen me on the television last night. I was so excited that it upset my stomach. I had nothing alcoholic at Grandma's over Christmas and I've been teetotal ever since. Perry's discovery in 1966 made him a respected figure in the American space community. He became a consultant to the US Library of Congress. In England, he remained a schoolteacher. He carried on tracking the Soviets in space with pupils at Kettering until his early retirement in 1984. The school has not continued his space program. He's a remarkable man, Jeffrey Perry. I think uh, an unsung hero in his own country. They weren't looking for kudos, they weren't looking for anything except why the thing was going by when it went. And he took these lads and got them expert in time separation, orbits, perigees, apogees, things that they'd never heard about before, and he ended up finding Plisetsk to the astonishment of the world and its spooks. Wherever I go in the States, whatever space group I'm talking to, they've heard of Jeff Perry and the Kettering group and about the boys that he taught in physics and all of that. And when I come here, he's really not as well known as he is in a country that's 3,000 miles away. It's very curious. I've never understood why Jeffrey Perry hasn't got more recognition in his own country from the scientific community or the educational community for that matter. He is very, very well known in both those bodies in this country, but not in the United Kingdom. And I just will never understand it.
Greenwood and the teams are out to prove who is first class.